Hello, my name is Sylvia Sejan, and I'm a PhD student at the University of Toronto. I am presenting Developability of High Flows via Rank Minimization, a joint work with Noam Eigerman of Adobe Research and Alec Jacobson of the University of Toronto and Adobe Research. Our work concerns two key concepts, developability and height fields. So let's begin by defining them. A surface is said to be developable if it can, can be obtained by bending or folding a planar patch without stretching it. Developable surfaces show up in the real world every time we build something out of sheets of non-stretchable material, like paper, wood, or steel. On the other hand, a height field can be thought of as an image, which, instead of the traditional RGB values, stores a single height value for each pixel. The prototypical example is topographical data, in this case of the San Francisco Bay Area. All our images from this talk will be height fields even if they have arbitrary boundaries, like in this case, or if they are rendered for clarity as surfaces, like in the right here. Since we'll often omit the grayscale image on the left, it is important that we remember, from now on, we will only be showing height fields. OK, now that we've introduced these concepts, let's take a look at the problem we want to solve. We can state it like this. Given a generic height field as input, how can I get a piecewise developable height field as output which resembles this input. You can imagine this as me wanting to know what is the closest thing to this bunny that I can build out of bent sheets of metal or pieces of paper. The current state of the art for solving this problem is the work presented at SIGGRAPH 2018 by Stein and colleagues. Their method can be applied to any triangle mesh of a surface. However, it is not a convex optimization and is therefore very dependent on the initialization. It also presents a deep discretization dependence since their bending directions must align with mesh edges. And resolution dependence with finer models representing more developable patches than coarser ones. Finally, they include no user control over the balance between the number of patches and the fidelity of the output to the input. Our method, on the other hand, begins by restricting ourselves to high fields only. And we show that for the case of high fields, we can solve the problem in a complex way that is discretization and resolution independent and includes a parameter that allows for user control over developability and data fidelity. By the end of this talk, you'll hopefully know how to turn this height field of a bunny into a piecewise developable one. Let's take a look at how we manage this. We will frame obtaining the, the output height field as an energy minimization problem. The energy will need to include two parts one that encourages developability, and one that encourages closeness or proximity to the input, together with a parameter lambda that allows the user to choose between prioritizing faithfulness or prioritizing developability. Let's start with the first one. We want to build an energy that is lower the more developable a height field is. And let's begin with the most common definition of developability. A height field is developable if its Gaussian curvature is zero in every point. Intuitively, the Gaussian curvature can be seen as a local geometric average of the curvature in every direction. One definition of the Gaussian curvature is that it's the determinant of a two by two matrix called the second fundamental form. Our first observation is that if we have a height field Z defined over a region R of the plane, then the second fundamental form is proportional to the matrix of second derivatives of this Z function, commonly called the Hessian matrix H. This means that we can redefine a height field as being developable if the determinant of its Hessian matrix is zero everywhere. Since the second fundamental form is proportional to the Hessian, then one having determinant zero means necessarily the other one has the determinant zero. Since the Hessian is a two by two matrix, its determinant being zero only means that its rank is one or zero. That is, its rank is smaller, strictly smaller than two. This already gives us a good candidate for a developability energy. Something we can do is integrate the rank of this Hessian everywhere in R. You can think of this integral as a double integral in X and Y for the simple, simple square domain R. However, the rank is not a convex function. And we would prefer that our energy involves only convex functions so that we can guarantee that it has a unique minimum 
and that we can minimize it using convex optimization techniques. Therefore, we will use the convex envelope of the rank function, called the nuclear norm, and defined as the sum of singular values of the matrix, or more simply, the absolute values of the eigenvalues. This norm is surprisingly a convex function, and it is in fact the tightest convex envelope of the rank function. function. Okay, so we have finished building the developability term in, in our energy, which remember looks something like this. Our original energy looks something like this. And we can thus substitute our new developability energy. And it looks like that. And for our data finality term, given that we want to penalize deviation from the input high field, an immediate choice is to pick the L2 norm of the difference between the high field, our high field and the input, something like this. We've succeeded in building a smooth energy that balances developability with fidelity to the input. However, we don't want to minimize this energy mathematically. We want to do it in a computer with finite memory and finite power. So we'll need to discretize it. The obvious discrete equivalent of a height field is a depth image, a finite set of square pixels with an associated Z value for each of them. For an image like this, it is easy to translate our energy from before that had all the integrals over R into simply sums over every pixel. If we picture a column vector called capital Z that contains every height value, then we can write the right term in this energy as the square norm between Z and the input Z. Our only remaining challenge now is then to discretize HI, the Hessian matrices at each point in the, in the pixel grid. Now for a square pixel grid like this, we can approximate the Hessian at the green point number five here as a linear combination of the height values in all of its immediate neighbors. We won't get into detail into how we do this. We do it using quadric fitting for those who know what that means, and we refer to the rest of the paper. Something we observe is that this approach introduces a high degree of bias in our computed Hessians. With this square grid, we are much more likely to get Hessians whose eigenspaces are aligned with the xy axis than with any other direction. This is unacceptable for us. We want a method that avoids any directional bias. And it is because of that that we switch to this hexagonal center grid, where again, we can approximate the Hessians as linear functions of the heights, but now in a way that is surprisingly bias free. Also note that if we combine A with a selection matrix that it identifies each point to its local neighborhood, we can rewrite the Hessian at this green point as some matrix A, which is different from every point, times our capital Z column vector. Great, so now we can rewrite our discrete energy like this. In terms of AI, which is this matrix that combines the linear fitting of a Hessian with the selection matrix of the neighborhoods of each point, Lambda, which is a user-determined parameter that chooses between balances these two parts of the energy, and Z input, which is simply the input height field. Once we have our energy, then the obvious next step is how do we minimize it? I, given a Z input and a value of Lambda, how do we find the Z that minimizes this energy? Now, this is where all our previous hard work pays off. Our energy has two components. And surprisingly, both of them are convex. In the green circle, we are compositing a linear function, the product of AI times Z, which is convex, with a nuclear norm, which is convex, with a sum over every pixel, which is also a convex function. So since, and since composition preserves convexity, then the green circle is altogether a convex operation. Same happens with the blue circle, which combines a quadratic uh, function, which is also convex, and the product with a constant, which is, which is also convex. Summing two convex functions is also convex, which means that we have a total convex energy E. In fact, this energy is more than convex. It can be written as a semi-definite program. However, we're going to go a different route in minimizing it, thanks to an additional observation. The energy in our green circle, our developability energy, measures local information at each point, right? We are looking at the neighbors, neighbors of each point to approximate the Hessian, so it is in some way a local quantity. Our data fidelity energy, on the other hand, measures a global quantity, 
the difference between two height fields. This local global duality in our energy make it a perfect candidate for minimization via the alternated direction method of multipliers, also known as ADMM. We detail what this means in the paper, but summarized, ADMM is an iterative approach, which combines a local update, an update of, associated with the green circle here, which we write as in a closed form and can be parallelized, and a global update that amounts to solving a system of linear equations and whose left-hand side we can often pre-compute. These two steps are repeated until convergence. This is all we're going to cover in this talk about the minimization process, but I do encourage you to look at the paper for details, including how we managed to write step one in a closed form, which is far from trivial. OK, we've described our method pretty well. Now it's time to see it in action. Let's begin with some experimental evaluations. Our most basic question is, does our method really output a piecewise developable output? We test this for this non-developable input, which we paint according to the absolute value of the Gaussian curvature. Blue means less developable. Blue is bad in this image. Note that our method does not directly minimize the Gaussian curvature. So this is a good way of seeing whether our energy is a good proxy for developability. After running our method, we see that the non-developability, the blue, is concentrated in creases, which is what, what we would expect from a piecewise developable surface. Now, let's examine our claim of resolution independence. We run our method in six differently upsampled versions of this bunny, from 2,000 vertices to almost a million vertices. And note that the outputs are very, very similar almost visually undistinguishable from the second onwards. Furthermore, we know that the ADMM iterations needed for convergence remain roughly constant, while the actual wall clock time for each complete run of our method grows roughly linearly with the size of the input. Let's move on now to orientation independence. To test this, we we'll consider a cylindrical input which both our method and the state of the art keep as it is, since it is already a developable surface. This is what we would expect. Note that the edges of the grid, in this case, the, the edges we are plotting is as a triangular mesh, but these are the edges of our hexagonal grid, are aligned with the direction in which the cylinder is bending. However, if we rotate our grid by 90 degrees, having the same shape, but just a slightly different visualization, the method of Stein and colleagues are, is unable to register the misaligned cylinder as a developable surface, so that it, they produce this different output. Ours, however, outputs the same cylinder without problems. We carry out an even stronger stress test of our resolution independence. By running our method in this model, where, where the expected creases, we've done it on purpose, are misaligned by exactly 10 degrees with respect to our grid edges. A method with any considerable orientation bias would create an artifact in the output with the creases being forced to align with the grid. Our method, however, has no problem in, out in outputting the perfectly misaligned creases. Finally, let's take a look at the effect of our lambda parameter in the output. Since a higher lambda means more weight to data fidelity, we expect that higher lambdas will produce outputs closer to the original height, maybe at the cost of producing more patches or more creases while a lower lambda will do just the opposite. Indeed, that is what we see for this input. We start from a very small lambda, which produces a small number of patches and is very far from the input. And as we grow lambda, the number of patches and the similarity with the input both increase. Great, now that we are happy with how our method works, let's see what we can use it for. An immediate application of our method is denoising depth scanning data. In this case, we scan the pages of a book, known to be developable because it's made out of paper, using a smartphone app. The output, however, had unacceptable amounts of noise, which we highlight by rendering with a specular material. Our method recovers the smooth, developable pages of the book. Note how our method does not smooth the crease in the middle between the pages of the book, something that other smoothing methods that do not account for developability would have done. Our method is valid in any environment in which one obtains depth data. For instance, we use a badly calibrated experimental setup to scan a folded sheet of paper. 
the output contains noise very specific to these miscalibrations. To make it even harder, we add, ra we add random noise on top of it. And even then, our method recovers a smooth piece of developable paper while maintaining the creases that come from the folding paper. Our method can take any input, even if it's far from developable. The high field we saw before, which contains high and low frequency detail and is very far from a piecewise developable one, is converted into one by our method. The same happens to our Einstein bus from the beginning of the talk, which becomes piecewise developable. Finally, another nice application of our method is to develop a modeling. Given a set of constraints, which can be drawn in any image editing software, we can minimize just the developability portion of our energy subject to these linear constraints to obtain a piecewise developable high field. We can use this, for instance, with the real world plan of a cathedral to build it a developable room, which one can then build out of any non stretchable material like metal. In sum, our newly introduced method returns piecewise developable high fields and can be used for a very diverse set of applications. This excites us to look forward into possible future improvements of our method. For instance, we would like to use our energy to directly segment the shape into developable patches. While we only briefly considered this in the paper, we hope that the existing de developability segmentation literature can benefit from a rank minimization perspective. Finally, we would like to remove the main limitation of our method, which is it's restricted to high fields only, and generalize it to work on any surface embedded in 3D. One way of doing this would be to use our high field method, but random inputs from from, that result from different view angles on a surface in a similar way to that introduced by Leo and colleagues. We are very excited about following this direction in the future. More broadly, we hope that this rank minimization perspective that we introduced informs future works on developability in general. To end, let me thank our sponsors. And in my name and that of my two co-authors, thank you for listening and watching to this talk. Stay safe. Have a nice day.